to make a, a short introduction first about uh, the panel. So, but this is just to, to get some joint picture about the future. So if we imagine today one newborn kid, so it's he or she is born in 2019, probably he or she will uh, graduate in 2038 and work till 2078 if the retirement age will be after 40 years maybe it will be cancelled in the meantime so for sure these kids probably will reach uh, the next millennia so if we are thinking about uh, education we, we are thinking about this period between 2038 and 2078 which is really far future so now the question for us is what kind of education can prepare them for this life and future challenges, not for our lives and our societies and our experience, but for something that is waiting for them in this unknown future. And it brings us to the question of the future. So now it's very nice exercise to imagining uh, the future. And of course, uh, we know that we, we cannot know what is going to wait for us in future, but I have, a I have an answer for you. And this is on the next slide. So now, are you ready? This is what we know about the future. It's not so sad, so we know something. <coughs> and uh, probably we know some direction, but not too much. But still, we have some kind Quite of... ...competencies and skills that young people will need in their future. And here you can see the list of different competencies and of course collaboration is one of the central uh, competencies. So speaking about collaboration, we know that, uh, okay, we don't know specifics about the future, but what we for sure know is that uh, kids will need uh, collaboration competencies. If you are interested, you can find uh, some interesting documents about that project. So then this is a very nice Google tool. You can see history of different terms. And this is the history of the term col uh, collaboration. So you can see that more or less till beginning of the previous century, people didn't use too much this word. But then during 40s, probably because of the war, we have some peak in using of collaboration. But then you can see again that uh, use of collaboration term is rising up. So the, this is also another indication that uh, future kids will need uh, support to build uh, collaboration competencies. Then we have uh, some global challenges. So, and these challenges cannot be uh, resolved uh, just by one country or one organization. So we need to collaborate strongly and widely. And this is also a uh, sustainable goal, so it's not possible to imagine that we can reach these goals if we don't collaborate. And also migrant crisis, so it is also a result of some kind of uh, uneven development in the world and uh, it's very difficult to solve it if different <coughs> countries, different governments, organizations do not cooperate. So this is really something that cannot be solved without collaboration. So we need to talk about <coughs> collaboration because we know that it's, it's going to wait for our children in, in the future. And uh, in this panel, we have a really nice group of people. They are going to discuss about collaboration experience in different contexts. And our main focus is to identify some key challenges when there is collaboration because collaboration is very nice but very difficult because it's so nice to collaborate with people who are same like you are and they are thinking the same they have the same background but fortunately or unfortunately we need to collaborate also with people who are very very different from us and it brings different challenges and this is why this uh, competence for collaboration doesn't come easy and also, if this is true, that uh, future uh, adults need uh, collaboration competence, we need to think about current education, how it should be changed or accommodated to this need. So this is what we are going to discuss about. So the plan is that after this introduction, every one of us will have 10 minutes to present uh, the, the relevant information or experience about collaboration and then we are going to have discussion that we believe 
15, 20 minutes for discussion. So, and then you are going to be invited to, to take part in the discussion. So we will keep this time for discussion at the end of the session, uh, because if we start to discuss after each session, probably it's going to be very difficult to keep uh, time and to keep ourselves on time because lunch is waiting for us after. So we need to collaborate during this uh, uh, session. So now I, this is the list of speakers. I will be the first one. Jorge is the second, Emily, Tanya, and then Dmitri. And I hope that you will enjoy in, in our presentations and discussion especially. So I would like to tell you two stories I find interesting f to share with you. First one is from the project, uh, we get focused on the good scores. So I will not get uh, into details how we identified or what we imagine as a good school. And the second one is based on my research studies about collaboration between uh, students and young people. So that studying good schools, so the, of course, the general discourse about the general education in, in Serbia is not very satisfactory so that everybody is complaining so that uh, you will you will hear a lot of like critical remarks and basically this is true so we cannot say that this is a uh, wrong belief so there is a lot of difficulties but in that project we tried to go in opposite direction we just assume that even by chance even if you have very lousy education system even by chance you need to have some schools where things works very nicely so then we said okay let's try to identify these schools and to learn from them what they are doing and uh, so then we, we in invited very different kinds of people and we put together different perspectives on, on different schools in Serbia and then we identified 10 such schools. And then we visited uh, each school to try to learn something like what they are doing, how they create these practices they are using in their schools, what is important for them, where they are heading, what are challenges they are facing with. So we simply wanted to learn from them. Because these schools, they operate in the same education system like all other schools. So it is the same way of initial education of teachers, same financing, same policies, same hierarchical relationships with uh, s uh, ministry and policy makers. Everything is the same, but somehow they manage to find their way. And when we summarize our experience from these schools, we have learned that they are all different. So we know, for example, from previous studies that uh, when you get focused on the school principals, that usually the best like approach for school principal is democratic approach. But somehow among these schools, we found schools with really like democratic school principal, but also less a fair school principal. He is appointed by political reasons, but he is clever enough to recognize that he or she has very good group of uh, teachers. So his job is just to secure for them the space to do their job. So then you have someone who is a little bit authoritarian uh, school principal, but he's accepted by, by his teachers and they respect him, they rely on him. So somehow we find out that all these factors that are in research literature identified like positive or negative, so you can find them in good schools. So it's about composition. But there is something that was uh, similar in all uh, schools. And this is why I put it on the next slide. So it's about collaboration. In all schools, we found people who collaborate with each other. So in Serbia, you, we have subject teachers, especially subject teachers. They are trained in different faculties and their identities are different because they take themselves as professionals in certain discipline and they don't usually collaborate. But in these schools, they collaborate with each other. Also, teachers collaborated with parents, with students, with school principals. So you find different schools but all schools are the same based on the fact that people collaborate with each other and somehow it seems that it goes very easy and very well and I put this quote from one teacher she has told us 
I'm traveling each day one hour to come to the job, but I would never change this uh, school because I know that I can rely on other people. So when I, I can go in any class to visit any class without any announcement and people can come in my class and whenever I have some crazy idea, I can go to the school principal, he will support me. I have very nice collaboration with parents, etc., etc. So it was really something about human relationships. It, it was not about money, it was not about equipment, so that was really about uh, collaboration. So for us it might be just side thought, uh, because obviously it, it happened just like that, so it was not result of some policy. But now we might think uh, in the other way. What would be if for example, ministry would create policy to support schools to explore their ways to become good schools in their terms. What does, what, whatever it means for teachers, for parents, for students in, in specific community. So that would be, we have discussed uh, during previous days about how to create balance uh, tasks to students and they need to work together and this is very important. We ask from them to agree at the end. So. Uh, this is this is an uh, interesting request. So what we have uh, learned, uh, there are many challenges. It's not so easy to put students uh, to work together. And there are different ways how they try to escape to collaborate. So first, sometimes uh, they have a challenge to being engaged. Because if you are in the group, so students say, okay, maybe somebody else will do the job for all of us. I don't need to, to be uh, proactive or to get engaged. Then it is very difficult to build joint understanding of the task. And not only that, it is, uh, what is our goal? So, okay, maybe my goal is, I understand the task the same like you, but my goal is just to avoid to be engaged. But maybe somebody else is very interested in that task. So how to collaborate and cooperate and to work together, then respecting others, to listen others, to provide arguments or to express your opinion. So this is uh, all challenges and we, saw that our students have difficulties, it doesn't come so easy for them. But, and there was one important barrier for collaboration uh, among our students that was really surprising for us. So it was uh, that uh, for our students, your participants, then we learned that for them it was very unusual to collaborate because based on their experience, collaboration in these schools means cheating. And then we start to discuss. So it means that it is not enough just to go in the school and to train students to collaborate. Because first we need to negotiate with them that collaboration is meaningful and that this is not something negative. So why is that in our schools? First we have focus on individual learning. So each student learns for himself or herself. Then teachers, they are working individually. Then we have culture of competition, so they compete to each other. And then we have assessment practices which are based completely on the individual uh, results. So it means that current dominant practices in our education system uh, are set up in such a way that they cannot promote collaboration. They can even prevent the development of collaboration. So now the question for us, like we said, what kind of education can prepare students for, for the future? So for sure this is not this kind of the school. It should be something more like that. And you can see teacher here, uh, she doesn't uh, make lectures, but she is just there to be a resource for students, like any other resource, internet, books, like school resources, teachers, or, and they collaborate in order to understand certain project they're going to, to solve, and you can play with this kind of education. And this is not something that cannot happen. So this kind of education inbuilt in itself collaboration. So this is why we can assume that uh, students who participate in this kind of education, they will develop collaborative competencies uh, for future. So thank you for your attention. So now I will give uh, the floor to Jorge.
and he would like to play for us some movie. Yes. Thank you very much. I am uh, Jorge Jimeno uh, from Center for Innovative uh, Education. I am in charge of uh, institutional and inter international relations over there. And what we are doing is identify good practices uh, on innovative education and trying to implement it in other mainly European regions. And this is one of them. The following project is a personal development program designed to support young people overcome the challenges that they might be facing at that particular time. Really passionate about the idea of using the outdoors to help people learn about their, their capabilities and learn a bit about themselves. A lot of challenges, the feeling of, I really don't know if I can do this or not, and being able to do it is just fantastic. And how that can be transferred into the everyday life and how that can be beneficial in their future jobs in the workplace. We can see very clearly on a day-to-day -day basis that the young people are gaining self-awareness, building confidence um, and getting a better idea of what their skills and strengths are. A really, really powerful process and a fantastic one to be involved with. Thank you. Okay, so it's me again. Oh, so maybe I can even stand. Sorry, I prefer to speak like walking. Um, you know who I am, so I think that we can pass to the next one. Um, I want to see you, uh, to show you, sorry, how looks like the video behind. So how you make a consortium capable to win and capable to uh, um, make or bring positive outcomes. Uh, first of all, if we want as an institution create a consortium or be part of one of, uh, of them, we need to think in two ways. Yeah. First of all, the most important thing, the funder prior priorities. If we are talking about our ministries or the European Commission or the EA grants or other kinds of uh, funds, first of all, we need to fit in here with our idea 100%, not 98, 100%. And secondly, we should respect as much as we could our institutional priorities. So, for example, if we are a university of um, social sciences, and we do have the opportunity to be part of a partnership uh, for universities, but specialized on I don't know, food resource. Uh, should we be over there because of the money, or we should just pass and look for another opportunities? So we should be as honest as we can with our own strategy and with our own priorities in terms of, in terms of institution. <coughs> Why? Hello. Why are we choosing these partners? So we know that we find our fund, we can afford to, or we want to afford um, 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 the creation of a consortium or to be part of a consortium, and now we are looking for our partners. In this case that you show, uh, we are implementing the uh, Edinburgh's model created by uh, University of Edinburgh and Venture Trust, a charity from Scotland that are practically using this method for uh, help young people with, uh, with problems to, to get back to the, let's say, normal society. And we are implementing this model in Ireland, Poland and Spain at the same time. So we choose the expertise, which in this case is the Edinburgh's model. We knew, because we, know, uh, we, knew, uh, we met them before, that this model goes very good with the funder prior priorities, so with the Norway funds priorities, to find a model that will effectively counteract needs phenomenon. So young people that are not studying, not working. We need or we cho uh, choose also um, partners by structure. So we create two different models, three different models, sorry, of partnership. One for Spain, where we, uh, when we have um, a local government, a regional government, Cantabria's government, and a company specialized in uh, contract and employment. 
Uh, in Ireland, we uh, take the Limerick Institute of Technology. So it's a polytechnic, much more like technique and uh, vocational education and very uh, fit in the land. So with a lot of contacts with the social partners that we will need. Uh, need. And in Poland, the food banks and ourselves. So trying to make it the same through a third sector perspective. So as you can see, for our, uh, for, from our part, the cross-sectoral approach is also a key element. So we uh, check governmental side, academical side, NGO side. Definitely, until now, uh, the best one is the governmental side because they have the bigger amount of tools. Um, so we had the structure, we had the, the expertise, but we also had the prestige. It was specially for us uh, to choose Edinburgh University because we knew that Center for Innovative Education just don't have the name and the brand enough to win a 4 million euro uh, proje uh, project. So this is why we show that, in fact, we are taking in direct cooperation with them a model that exists, and it's, it was developed by the 24th university in the world. And friendship. This is something that occurs very usually, and it's not such a good idea. I mean, we used to work with several partners. Partners are people, we like people, so we like to work with people that we like. But this doesn't mean that these people are the correct partner for this project. It's not like, I like you, we will work again together. And in here, you have most or a lot of surprises, surprises in terms of critical situations inside of partnerships. Finally, how we will work together. We, in the Center for Innovative Education, believe that consortium is a new institution. So it's like a joint venture. So we will have, again, communication department, research department, uh, merit department, and so on, instead of this approach, individual work of the partners. So you will do this part, you will do with this part, and at the end, we will put everything together probably it will be good enough. So, has, uh, in academical world, I know that we should put here, develop a common strategy, ha have a common agenda, uh, budgetary issues, and so on, so on. So this is not the theoretical part of it, this is the practical part of it. So, for us as leader, being much smaller institution than, uh, than our partners, and in charge of all the project, so not only the people who are there to help our partners regionally, so in all these four countries, but also until we showed or we discover among all the partners that we have problems with communication because, for example, Spanish people hate uh, big letters and Irish people hate red letters. Uh, I mean, yeah, you understand me properly. So if you have mails, as for example, from our side, just to remark one thing, using big letters and red letters, it was like a civil war inside of the partnership. <laughs> and for us, it was only to remark that this part is quite important. Just that it, we love you, you are going really well, but we only want to show you. So cultural differences started in a mail but are all the, uh, in all the parts of the project. So we need to adapt one model for three different, uh, different countries, and we need to be extremely adaptable and extremely elastic in terms of how we will face all the challenges and all the outcomes that we will sign in a document with quite serious people that will deliver for sure. So it's like non-stop uh, adaptation, adaptation, and we need to be in each detail. Language, language is difference. Uh, language is differences, sorry. Like this, for example. As you can see, I am not an English speaker. Um, Spanish is my mother's tongue, and also Polish. 
So uh, this is also important. I mean, first meetings were an Aidmar. We have Irish in the room, we have Scottish in the room, and we have the rest. And it was, it was like 20 minutes for a police to think or to say something that for an Irish is like two minutes and a half. So how you can manage this communication having the knowledge that you really understand each other pretty well. And it's not everything in the mails, because most of time there is such big amount of information that it's impossible to have it here, everything at the same time. Load of work. You know, or you need to know, that this month one partner will work more. But next month, this partner will have an audit, will have another project, will have, I don't know, exams in terms of uh, universities. So just don't try to push them hard, Ad accept it, and move forward, and be prepared to move forward in such a scenario. And adapt yourself to decisions change, where, for example, with the government is the worst part uh, of the partnership. Because, for example, we need to make audits every six months, but we had last year um, elections, regional elections in Spain. So our regional partner changed all the directors, ministries, and so on. So they need to start the, procedu uh, the procedures for audit again. So now we have a kind of blind discussion between one government and the, and, and the other one, talking about why you are not doing audit and why I cannot make the audit. So it's like these kind of small surprises are everywhere. So from the very beginning when you are planning a partnership, you should take also in consideration how the decision chain uh, looks like in your partner. And finally, how to manage critical situations. A lot of them. In fact, a partnership is a critical situation. You can just define it like this. The very beginning is very nice, mainly the kickoff meeting when everyone is smiling and uh, we have the nice dinner with nice wine because everyone wants to make the best uh, presentation of him or her. But when you start to work, it's a critical situation. So we need to be adaptable. Forget about your own rules. We have partnership rules. So we need to be there for each new situation with an out-of-the-box perspective. Because if we start among partners to say, no, no, but my statute uh, say this, and my rules say that, it's impossible to move forward. Consensus. Sacrifice. You can make the best budget ever, but you will always forget at least 10% of workload. So you will need to sacrifice your budgets, your people, your say is something like it's extremely important. I don't know if this helps uh, you or not, but I am very happy to share this experience with you. Thank you. Thank you, Jorge, very much. So uh, now, Emily, it's your turn. Hello. Um, so my name is Emily Kaufman, and since we've been hearing a lot from the educator's perspective, I'd like to offer a little bit of something from the student's perspective. Um, so starting in the fall of 2018, I took a class at the University of California, Santa Barbara, entitled Social Marketing with Professor Walid Afifi. The objective of the course was to work collaboratively towards making a positive change in our community through the use of social marketing principles. So to give a little background on the structure of the class, um, our class of roughly 80 participants began with an open discussion about social issues in our community. Um, we were asked to take the weekend to think about which issues we were most passionate about with the understanding that we would divide ourselves into groups of three to five students in the next class. So to keep us on a steady path to achieve the course objectives, we were given weekly assignments to be completed as a group and uploaded to a group drive on Google. The assignments required we demonstrate understanding of social scientific theories and frameworks discussed in class using scientific resources whenever relevant. I partnered with four students with the common interest of reducing food waste. 
As we began our research into articulating the problem, we quickly found that food insecurity being defined as inadequate access to, shockingly, even members of my very own group didn't know that we had an on-campus food bank that provided free, nutritious groceries for all students. When it became time to draft a required survey of our audience, we benefited from the unique standpoint of being members of the audience that we were surveying. Our survey measured students' awareness um, of the Associated Student Food Bank, as well as their views on its accessibility, as well as their views on receiving food from the food bank and any social stigmas that may exist there. Our findings showed that of the students surveyed, 63% of them had never even used the food bank. Over 70% of the students answered that they would use the food bank, but that the location as well as the operating times were the largest barriers to use, with many students expressing feelings of embarrassment or shame attached with receiving these free groceries. So with this new information, back to my dining room table we went. So over chocolate, um, peanut butter cups, and lemonade, the idea for a temporary food distribution stand using resources from the AS Food Bank was birthed. But with this idea came our first barrier, convincing the AS Food Bank to get on board with our idea and supply us the food. So by the next week, we were meeting with not only the AS Food Bank, but various on-campus organizations to measure potential interest in volunteering for these events. Before each meeting, we would gather and create lists of questions and talking points. By collaborating on this, we are able to think of not only the questions that we may have for our audience, but questions that they may have for us. Um, these pre-meeting discussions were incredibly useful for us to recognize and edit any flaws in our ideas, as well as ensure we were considering the theory that we were learning in lecture. At the end of our fall term, we had a solid project idea for what we referred to as pop-up food banks. To, they, these events were to be hosted twice a month in the heavily foot-trafficked areas of campus um, on the one day that the food bank was closed. But all of this was only an idea. Thankfully, Professor Fifi decided for the first time in the history of the course to offer students the opportunity to implement these projects for course credit in the winter term. With this came a whole new added level of collaboration. The new structure of the class was such that all students would attend weekly group meetings to discuss our projects and any barriers that we were facing, as well as offer each other insight and resources um, of our own. Within my personal group, only three of the five of us decided to continue on with implementation. Though we had the food bank support um, with implementation came new barriers, such as how would we transport the food across our very large campus? Who would our volunteers be? How would we advertise this event? How would we reduce stigmas related to the food bank? Each week we met and worked with many organizations and university departments um, to overcome these barriers. We obtained electronic carts, tables, and a canopy for protection from the elements from the athletics program on campus. Um, I conducted trainings on food bank procedures to our volunteers, which were gathered from UCSB's Zero Food Waste Committee, as well as an on-campus service fraternity, Alpha Phi Omega. We developed info, infographics and signs emphasizing the correlation between food waste and insecurity, and advertising materials were distributed through both department emails as well as social media platforms. Every step of the way, we were um, both assisted and supported by our peers in the larger group meetings. When we ran low on volunteers and were in danger of canceling one of our events, they stepped forward to help. From their experiences, we learned how to work with churches, school districts, and community centers, and many, many more. By drawing on our collective strengths, all of our projects came out the better for it. In reflecting on the year-long course and trying to pick out any cons from this experience, I fell a little short. And this isn't because the course was perfect but rather because of Professor Afifi's willingness and eagerness to collaborate with us. He consistently checked in with us on ways to improve the course and our environment. He created a space where we felt comfortable voicing our needs in real time. If you asked me five months ago about flaws with the class, 
I probably would have said something about my group mates pulling unequal weight and relying on me to remind them of their tasks. However, with a little distance from the experience, I now believe that this served as an invaluable lesson on leadership. Through all of these varied types of collaboration, we not only learned and applied social scientific theory, but learned how to organize and structure meetings, how to put on a successful event, how to communicate with different audience and groups, and this is just to name a few. The most important aspect of this course was that it created a risk-free opportunity to nurture and explore our strengths, as well as to see how few people it takes to produce change. Overall, we increased access to um, free textbook resources. We developed social mentorship programs for at-risk youth in the community. We created educational materials on college readiness for first-generation college students. And in the case of my own project, um, provided groceries for nearly 400 students, registering over 200 of them for the very first time with the on-campus food bank. This is not the type of education that you can Google, and this was by far the most impactful experience of my college ex education. Thank you so much. Uh, hi. Um, I will try, uh, I will start actually with the conventions, uh, with the convention of the right of the child. As you know, many children lack the knowledge and skills to realize their full potential and maximize their contribution to their communities. If you are seeing data globally, at the current rate, by uh, 2030, of the, uh, of the 1.4 billion school age children in low and mid income countries, 420 million will not learn the most basic skills in childhood, and 825 million will not acquire basic secondary level skills. The gap between the levels of learning that educa education systems are providing and what children, communities, and economies need is growing. The breadth and depth of this learning crisis provides the greatest global challenge to preparing children and adolescents for life, work, and citizenship. The lesson of the learning crisis is clear. The conventional combination of education inputs is not improving learning outcomes and skills that today's children need in the 21st century. This presents a fund fundamental challenge to the way that the governments, development partners, and communities are managing and supporting education systems. Therefore, a new and more radical approach that focuses on enhancing learning outcomes forms the basis for the global UNICEF education protection for children in emergency and transition contexts. The strategy confirms the importance that UNICEF accords to education and the commitment to deliver along with partners the SDG for education and the realization of the conventions of the rights of the child so that every child learns. The strategy for us in UNICEF is a strategic shift towards a greater focus on improving learning outcomes, including supporting the development and of the breadth of skills that allow young people to become agile, adaptive learners and citizens, equipped to navigate personal, social, academic, economic, and environmental challenges. Although reading, writing, mathematics, and science are cornerstones of today's education, curricula must go further to include skills such as collaboration and digital literacy that will prepare students for 21st century employment. This, this, is, this uh, set of skills is all often portrayed as 4C, critical thinking, communication, collaboration, and creativity. So what is then 21st century learner? Uh, what is then 21st century job? Businesses are saying that we need more innovators in science, mathematics, and technology. Global leaders agree that for achievement of stable growth in the future, technology to modernize teaching. From another point of view, we know that uh, professional development, the concepts of professional development are actually not very efficient, at least those that we have uh, in our education systems. Uh, also, it is the question when we start to develop all these competencies of children. Do we wait for the secondary education or we start much earlier? 
uh, here in in, uh, in Serbia, in, in UNICEF and globally in UNICEF, we believe actually that there is no magic stick to improve all these uh, skills of children and actually to increase competencies of teachers to support children uh, to develop their competencies and skills. So there, are, there is a need really to, to, to start with comprehensive reforms and uh, I will show you an example how we started this uh, in Serbia with the preschool education system and how we, we are actually developing all this set of skills of very young children, children from three to five years old. So we are working on the comprehensive reform uh, of the preschool education and we are tackling all five areas that uh, are needed uh, to strengthen a preschool education system uh, to deliver quality at scale, which actually includes policy, regulation, planning, financing, uh, co competencies of teachers, data and measurement and partnerships. Uh, in Serbia, we are using partnership, uh, we are using the new curriculum in preschool education and the partnership with different actors as a niche for very comprehensive reform of the preschool education system. Main goal is actually uh, capacity building uh, of teachers and capacity building of system that will uh, actually support the development of children dispositions for lifelong learning to implementation of this new uh, new curriculum that uh, which, uh, whose name is Years of Ascent. Uh, entire curriculum is built actually on modern theoretical notions of so socio-cultural socio theory of learning and development and sociology of childhood. Uh, it's, uh, it is aiming to support the well-being of the child by developing and integrating the approach to learning and development, emphasizing the importance of play and building enabling and support relationship with peers and adults in a setting that provides inspirational environment for play, research and learning. Entire preschool concept in Serbia is supporting development of dispositions for lifelong learning that include and problem solving, critical thinking, teamwork, communication, entrepreneurial thinking. It is based on the philosophy on collaboration between children and preschool teachers, between preschool teachers and parents, and between preschool institutions and local community. Uh, it is in interesting that from implementation so far, uh, with uh, uh, you can, we can actually uh, witness different examples of very similar uh, po projects where children together with adults are actually developing uh, different projects and uh, they're trying and answering different questions that they are interested for them, for themselves. So um, entire uh, uh, capacity building program for teachers to be able actually to nurture and to boost the development of preschool teachers, of, pre, of preschool children is very comprehensive. And actually it, uh, it is uh, based and it, it, it cre and creates opportunities for networking, horizontal learning, mentoring by experienced practitioners and collaborative processes in training sessions. Uh, and the approach builds on powerful lessons on how adults learn and how these principles can be used in professional development. Uh, in addition, we are nurturing different types of partnership and collaboration for the implementation of entire capacity uh, building program uh, and in the implementation of, of curriculum. It is uh, cooperation between teachers, with, which is necessary to modernize education, to support teachers and parents in this challenging job, supporting development of 21st century skills. Through our work so far, we have learned that, uh, that key preconditions for establishment of partnerships are shared value and trust between partners. And if, uh, if I may say that collaboration per se is a not competence, it is uh, uh, actually a set of competencies that actually you need to possess in order to, to create collaboration and to be able to collaborate. And this includes communication, it includes openness, it is inclu includes active listening, it includes uh, teamwork, uh, it includes uh, ability to develop shared vision, ability to exchange knowledge, to solve problems together. So there are so many actually uh, small uh, soft competencies that we need to develop in order to be able to collaborate. Thank you. So now the... Mm -hmm. Put my presentation. Oh, okay.
just for the girls that I will not sit, not stay in a corner, I will stay here. <laughs> uh, well, uh, I'm uh, represented in I'm representing a big international organization, Intergov. Uh, ah, microphone. Okay. okay. Just as we I think without microphone, uh, my voice is loud enough. Ah, okay. Okay, okay. Is it right now? Uh, well, uh, I'm head of the Department of International Cooperation of a large international intergovernmental organization. And uh, this organization comprises uh, 18, and in fact, 17 countries at the moment. Uh, North Korea is presenting uh, only flag because of historical reasons, but seven active uh, full members of international uh, intergovernmental organization and six uh, associate members. And this organization is located uh, in Moscow, in Moscow region, in Dubna, 100 kilometers to the north, in an excellent place. So conditions and nature are really beautiful and probably the most uh, beautiful in the world for making scientific research. And also physically it's island. To those who will listen uh, at the next section presentation of Professor Karpov sitting here, will understand why it's island of stability. But uh, institute uh, is really big, it's the second biggest uh, research organization, international research organization on the earth. The first one is CERN and Geneva. Uh, and we have uh, a big um, international partner network. It's 800 destination in 62 countries at the moment. Uh, it is 5,000 or even a bit more people. Uh, uh, along them, uh, 1,200 are researchers. Uh, quite a number of them are from different countries, so we have uh, 33 in national time to explain little. But this is science and the facilities which are very beautiful, it's very important for the further uh, uh, discussion. So we have a uh, cyclotron complex. This uh, one unique feature which will be described in the uh, presentation of Professor Karpov, a uh, factor of super heavy elements. Everybody knows that now uh, is a year, international year of periodical table, so we are contributing very much to this work. Uh, we have a uh, uh, unique uh, pulsed reactor with a mechanical modulation for material science, so it's not only nuclear, it's material science. Uh, so we have uh, uh, on Baikal Lake uh, in uh, construction, but already the biggest uh, neutrino telescope in the, in the northern hemisphere. Uh, we have radiobiology, we have proton therapy facility, we have supercomputer, so big laboratory for uh, IT, not only supercomputer, but also cloud and grid infrastructure, it's a unique combination, so you will not find in any other lab in the world. And also, uh, uh, we are building now the heavy ion collider, which name is NICA. So, what I would like to say, that we are a laboratory where we can test all the uh, aspects of collaboration and uh, education which were laid tabled yesterday and today. So, interdisciplinarity, uh, multicultural, uh, academic mobility, and all the rest. But uh, oh, we are an international organization, we have different countries, they are also different in the wealth and uh, different in educate, ed education, so people are different coming to the institute. So it's really lab where we can test all this, but uh, let me concentrate on the most uh, common feature between all that. So uh, there are different aspects uh, of our collaboration and our education approach, but the common feature is bringing uh, scholars, students, teachers, and uh, uh, let's say society in touch with a modern scientific infrastructure. And I will tell you how it works. So for education purposes, we have a university center. It should not mislead you because we are not educating organization. We are a research organization. But uh, those big uh, flow of students, scholars, etc. should be organized. So for that purposes, we have a department which has different functions. Besides of uh, uh, bringing people to the institute, uh, we also make uh, quite big outreach programs and uh, skill improvement programs. And let me uh, just show you what kind of programs we have. First of all, we are speaking about education. Of course, the first what we should uh, think is the scholars. So, of course, scholars are very much interested in what is a longer program for a week. Uh, scholars is, of, of course, uh, very good. So, sometimes scholars are very good selected. But to get uh, better access to the education system, of course, of course, we have to work with teachers. And if uh, we started this uh, more than 10 years ago, and this is uh, to some extent joint project with CERN, 
And for, the, for example, this year uh, we hold a, a summer school for teachers in Dubna University, which is uh, also uh, on our campus. Uh, uh, with uh, 33, uh, 23 participants from four countries. And it was a special school uh, for uh, Czech teachers. Why it's uh, so different? Because uh, we have uh, member states and it's demand of member states. That's why it could be different from country to country. But uh, we established such courses. And uh, jointly with Sion, we also brought 24 uh, teachers from Russia uh, to Sion in our uh, joint program. Well, uh, now about students. Of course, students from different universities, in fact, I would say that it's worldwide, you see uh, what uh, countries are using our uh, programs. Uh, we started with uh, one uh, uh, single stage, three weeks in summer from member states, but now it's already four stages because the demand is huge. So the first stage in beginning of summer is occupied by South Africa, but recently we got Botswana and quite a number of other countries. Uh, the second stage is mostly uh, former uh, Soviet Republic, but also uh, Poland, uh, Romania, Slovakia, etc. Uh, the third stage uh, was uh, for primarily Egypt, because they have very big demand on, on uh, bringing uh, students to the institute, but now we have also Serbia, Belarus, Chile, and, and others. And uh, now we got uh, the fourth stage, which was the first time this year. So uh, this program is just three weeks. But uh, students come in and work in a small group on a certain small uh, project, which uh, gives them understanding what is the science and what we are doing, some hand on practice. But we have also some other uh, program, which is for six, eight weeks, where we are selecting people and we are funding them. And for, for, for this uh, year, for example, this uh, summer school is 20, uh, 40, uh, 56 uh, students from 16 countries. And this program was established in 2014. So uh, let, me, let me also mention that the short practice was uh, 2004. So each year we rethink what else uh, will comply with the need of our member states and our education program are growing. And in particular, uh, this year uh, we got 75 students from Warsaw Technological Institute. Why is such a singularity? Why? Uh, well, Poland is the second biggest uh, contributor to our institute. But uh, the reason is very simple. People make projects. And uh, the speaker of the biggest detector on our collider, MPD, it's a multi-purpose detector, Adam Kissel is from Warsaw Technological University. And he brought the idea that for the students, engineering students, it is extremely important to see modern infrastructure and to make small engineering program, pro, projects. So we still don't know would it contribute to the uh, collider which we are building, but definitely it will contribute to the skills of the student back to the university. And already we got participants from other universities from Poland through this channel. Uh, and duration of such practices from three weeks to three months depending on what they are doing. Uh, but uh, the basic mode uh, which delivers scientific product is uh, regular work with students. Um, and for that we have uh, long-term collaboration with the uh, leading university in Russia like uh, Moscow State, St. Petersburg State, Moscow uh, uh, State uh, Nuclear University which is known as Engineering Physics Institute, Moscow Physics and Technology University, Kazan University, etc. Also University of Dubna. Uh, but now we see that uh, there is a very big demand to uh, expand engineering skill. That's why we have made engineering practicum uh, located in our institute. Uh, first of all, to uh, cover the needs to study accelerated technology, which is not presented in other, in other countries. So, so international students coming to us to know how accelerators work. But it's in fact, it's a combination of different technology. Each technology has its own value. And also we established uh, together with Bauman Technological University, Dubna School for Engineers. So students will educate, start education there, and they will come to Dubna to make practical work at the later stage of their education. But if we take all this together, and think, could we make experiment how to bring institute to the student, rather to student to the institute? And we made such uh, experiment, you see here the logo of North Ossetia University, which is not known uh, as university preparing uh, good skilled student for, for uh, nuclear physics. But uh, the uh, rector of the university is a young energetic gentleman and he uh, committed to make experiment. So what we did, we took all our practices, all our uh, approach how to explain uh, about science, 
Uh, and in the first year, he just promoted the future opening of information center of Joint Institute in the university. So it's a zero-cost project. And uh, from the five uh, students coming each year, they got a full course of uh, 20 students for the first year. Uh, it's a physical and technical department. And the second year, after we just uh, helped our colleagues in North Ossetia with lectures, with uh, materials, etc. So several times I visited them uh, ourselves. But again, it's zero cost project. Now we have competition rate two and a half, and already one uh, colleague came for the toll based education. So I think it's a great success. So it's, we will continue, of course, this experiment and we'll see what will come out. But uh, uh, besides that, we put our lectures by our professors who are coming to our basic chairs in the universities uh, to the web, so everybody can benefit now from that, so it's, it's open, and it's over 500 lectures made in Russian and in English. All of them will be finally in English. We are building uh, also a virtual laboratory. We found that something is missing on the market. There is, a, uh, let's say, uh, some help to the teachers on a certain practicum is there. But if it's about complicated experiment, we found a niche which is not occupied. But what is most important that, again, we do this in a collaboration because uh, now we have partners in 12 countries on this virtual laboratory. But the main idea is that we jointly formulate the task which could be done by students with this uh, virtual laboratory. And of course, to learn all of that, we need uh, to educate decision makers. For that, we establish a program uh, five days, decision makers of the, I would say, quite senior, uh, senior level come into GNI and also the main, the only what we can do, we are not university, we are not teachers, we just bring them in a contact with our infrastructure and explain how it could be used. And you see here the list uh, of the uh, first 10 uh, programs, so uh, you see the champions, Serbia is in fact one of the champions in using this. Um, uh, opportunity, and uh, we see that uh, bringing students, scholars, and decision makers in the contact with infrastructure generate new ideas, generate creativity, as we understand. So let me finish with that. Um, the lo slo lo slogan of our institute is science bringing nation together. But we see that through bringing uh, scholars students, professors, decision makers in the contact with modern infrastructure we create in future. So experiment is continued. Thank you very much for your attention.